Amen. Amen. Happy Resurrection Sunday, church. He is risen. Some of y'all are like, what day is it? But isn't it? What I want to do today is I want to be in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4. And I want to continue this week a thought that we ended on last week. Last week, if you were here for an amazing Easter weekend with us, we ended with this thought from the end of the Gospel of Luke. And the end of the Gospel of Luke mentions the seven best words, my statement, not the Bible's, but the seven best words ever spoken that didn't come from the mouth of Jesus. He is not here. He is risen. We, we love that. In Easter time, we read something like this and we say, that's amazing. And sometimes we just leave the best news in yesterday. We don't bring it into today. What I want to do is I want to remember that time that we focused on yesterday and continue the thought of the seven best words from we learned last week into this week. He is not here. He is risen. See, we live in the reality now of the resurrection. Last week, we celebrated the resurrection. Now we live in the reality of the resurrection. It's, it's really the same uh, uh, truth that we all know that days matter. That, yes, I know that you love me if you celebrate me on my birthday, but if you don't talk to me any other day, then it doesn't mean a whole lot. Now, if you just give your husband the gift on his anniversary, that might be good for one day, but what about the other 364? It's the same reason that, yes, we might all love America, but there's something special about the 4th of July. That we understand days matter, but if we forsake every other day for just one day, it doesn't mean a whole lot. I want us to not just focus on the resurrection on Easter, but to focus on it every single day. Our love of Jesus isn't just shown one day, it's shown every day. And, and I might be naive enough or have enough faith to believe that the gospel story, the good news of the resurrection of Jesus still works. Yeah. That that is something that we can't simply just get past because the day or the week of Holy Week or the day of Easter is seemingly come and gone. We're going to be in Acts chapter 4, verse 32 and 33. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 and 33. And it simply says this, and all of the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. They continued to testify. And God's power, grace, was so powerfully at work within them all. What I want to title this message is really coming from a uh, southern proverb. And the title of the message is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Will you pray with me for a minute? Lord Jesus, we love you and we need you. God, we are remembering right now the resurrection of Jesus. And we're not going to move past it, Lord, but... We're going to sit in it. God, would you make it a reality for every single one of us in this room? Set our hearts and our minds, God. Would you open, God, the eyes of our hearts to see what you want us to see? Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place and we welcome your presence here. Knowing that your presence is truly the thing that can change us. We put no faith in music or public speakers or encouraging words. We put all of our faith in the presence of God being able to change us. So would you meet us here? Father, we love you so much. And more importantly, you love us. Holy Spirit, would you empower us to live, look, and love more like a Jesus today than we did yesterday. In Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's, it's this truth that we try to improve things that don't need improvement. 
We try and add to things that don't need to be added to. And we try and fix things that ultimately aren't broken. The whole crux of the message, which is horrible public speaking, but I'll give it to you right now. The gospel isn't broken. And the gospel doesn't need to be added to, fixed, given something by you. The gospel is enough. That's the crux of the message. If we leave the room right now, that's the message that I need for all of us to leave this room with. Is that if we don't understand that the gospel isn't something that we need to add a little bit of something else to. Yes, it was a good celebration then, but now what else, pastor? What else do I need to do? Then we're missing the whole point. The gospel is simply Enough. And you might say, well, okay, well, well, what do we do? Like, well, what happens after the resurrection? Doesn't life go on after the resurrection? Yeah, well, after the resurrection, I'll tell you what the Christian life means. After the resurrection, now you live in the resurrection. Simply that. That after you realize that God has woken up something in your heart and now you've chosen to follow him, what our decision is now is to now live in that resurrection because the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Now my life is living in response to that thing. And as we see in Acts chapter 4, I believe we're going to see three major things. One, we're going to see the transformation of resurrection. We're going to see the unity of resurrection. And we're going to see the grace in the resurrection. We see the transformation that comes in the resurrection as it comes from what Jesus did on the cross. And not just on the cross, but what happened three days later. That Jesus rose from the dead. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If transformation ain't broke, then don't fix it. In Acts chapter 3, it says they continued to testify about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You see, what happens so far from the resurrection at the end of the Gospels to where we are in the book of Acts now is that we see the, 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 the disciples are apostles and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus has come back and he's given them the Holy Spirit. And now we see that those who were once uh, uh, terrified, to say the least, now are preaching the gospel with boldness, specifically Peter. We see Peter, uh, actually, one of the last pictures we saw of him in the Gospels, if you remember, is that he claimed he would never deny Jesus, and then he denies him three times. He starts running away from strangers, starts cursing everybody, starts making these oaths that he can't keep. Then he ends up locking himself in a room, running away from all of the religious leaders, and then returning back to the job that Jesus actually called him out of to go fishing because he was so terrified. And then we see in the beginning of Acts that Peter actually comes with John, and as I see Peter and John in the story of Acts, I can only imagine what a dynamic duo this is. You have Peter, the rock of the church, and John, the beloved disciple, walking, and, and they see this man at the gate called Beautiful. And as they see this man, he's a man who's been lame. He can't walk for 40 years. They see him at this gate. Everybody's passing him by. He's asking for alms, asking for people to help him. Peter and John look at him and give the best line ever. He looks at him and says, expecting that they're going to give him some money, give him some alms. Peter looks at him in his face and says, silver and gold I don't have. But here's what I do. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. The man, after being lame for 40 years, stands up and says strength comes in his legs and he gets up and he walks. Then Peter ends up preaching the gospel, Jesus Christ and him crucified, raised from the dead. And guess what? 3,000 people get saved. Then you go a few chapters later, the Sadducees and the religious leaders don't like what's going on. The same people who actually persecuted Jesus, they end up seeing what has happened to this man. And after he's raised, he's dancing around. He won't stop following Peter and John, and then 5,000 people get saved. Now, if you're like me, you look at this story and you look at the book of Acts, and, and, and it's an insane story, and it's really, really encouraging. But you look at me and you're like, okay, hold on. The last time we saw Peter, he was running scared, denying Jesus, and hiding in a locked room. And the next time we see Peter is that now he's preaching to 3,000, 5,000 in, fa in the face of the same people who persecuted his Lord. And now he's raising people who were crippled for 40 years. What happened? 
the resurrection of Jesus happened. Listen, the cross of Jesus Christ did not make Peter bold. The resurrection of Jesus Christ made Peter bold. You notice that? Jesus died on the cross, and what happened to Peter? He was running for his life until Peter encountered the resurrection. Until the Holy Spirit made Peter bold. The resurrection changes everything. This is just an example of perfect love casting out all fear. That Peter was filled with fear after Jesus died on the cross. And we love that Jesus died on the cross. That's beautiful. We just celebrated that truth on Good Friday last week. It is amazing. But let me tell you something. The cross of Jesus did not make Peter bold. The cross of Jesus did not transform Peter. The resurrection of Jesus transformed Peter. He is not here. He is risen. That's the truth that we see in scripture, and now the resurrection, it teaches us that it does not just create things in you. The resurrection also kills things in you. The res- we, we love to believe that the resurrection is this beautiful thing that's going to make your life amazing and, and, and nothing ever is going to go wrong and life is going to be perfect. It, it wasn't this just Easter where we were all dressed nice and, and putting on our best Sunday fits and, and feeling great about ourselves. yes. The resurrection of Jesus will create some amazing things inside of you. But it would also kill some horrible things inside of you. The resurrection isn't just about resurrection. The resurrection is also about death. You see, Peter was raised and some things came alive in him. He was bold. He had faith. There was a transformation from one kind of man to another kind of man. But let me tell you, for Peter's boldness and his faith to come alive, Peter's fear had to die. And Peter was afraid. And Peter was terrified. Peter was denying Jesus. And now the same man who was terrified to even associate with Jesus now is preaching in front of the same people who killed Jesus. The resurrection does not just create things in you. The resurrection also kills things in you. Don't be mistaken, everybody. The resurrection of Jesus will cost you something. And the resurrection of Jesus will call you to die. So there are some things on the inside of all of us that need to die. Is there bitterness on the inside of you? The resurrection calls it to die. Is there pride on the inside of you? The resurrection calls that to die. Is there a a need for control in your life? The resurrection is going to call that to die. You have anxiety. You have depression. You have insecurity. Are you a lover of money? There's things that the resurrection is going to call you to die to. And this is exactly what we see in the Apostle Peter, that He could not stay the same after he had experienced the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus will call things to die in you, but it will call so many more things to come alive in you. Do you need peace? The resurrection is going to call life into your peace. Do you need joy? Because the resurrection will give life to your joy. Do you need hope? Because the resurrection will give you hope. It will give you patience. It will give you self-control. The resurrection, don't be confused. Although it will call you to die, it will call you to so much more life. There are things on the inside of you that you don't even know that God is calling to live, but he is. And the resurrection, once you see it, it will change everything. I believe that our job when it comes to the resurrection simply is this. If you want to be resurrected in Jesus, stop resisting Jesus. It's that simple (laughs) because we come to this moment and we're like, God, change me. Do something in my life. And everything that God is trying to feed, you keep starving. And everything God is trying to starve, you keep feeding 
God is calling you to let certain things die and you keep giving them CPR and say, God, what are you doing? And he's saying, I'm resurrecting. And you're like, this looks like death. And he's like, exactly. What if your resurrection actually sometimes looks like death? Sometimes we're feeding the things that God is actually calling us to starve. And we're starving the things God is actually trying to feed. The resurrection changes everything, including who we were and who we are. You see, the resurrection is trying to give us something, give us a new life in Christ. Luke chapter 24, verse 5 says this simply before uh, G- they, they realized, the, uh, the disciples realized that Jesus has risen from the dead. The angels speak this to them. They said, and as they were frightened, they bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Such a thought-provoking question that didn't connect with the disciples until the next statement. That these two dazzling men speak to these mourning men and say, why are you searching in this dead place for a living thing? And that same truth is true for us today. I don't know what it is about us, but if you're like me, why do you and why do I keep testing tombs for life? There are so many tombs that we try testing them for life when all they're known for is death. And the disciples are seemingly doing the same thing. All they're doing is they're testing tomb after tomb after tomb, looking for life when none is there. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you testing the dead things for the living things? Why are you expecting life to come out of that job when it doesn't have the capacity for it? Why are you expecting life to come out of your bank account when there's no capacity for it? Why are you looking for living things and dead things? Why are you looking for power to give you some self-confidence when you know that it can't come from outside, it has to come from inside? Why are you looking for that relationship to give you something that you know that that person can't ultimately give you in a core desire that you're trying to satisfy with a critical desire? Why are you looking for the living things and the dead things? The same issue that the disciples had is oftentimes the same issue that we have that we're actually looking in the tombs for life. Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? Church, why are you testing tombs? He is not here. (laughs) Jesus can't be found in your success. He is not there. Jesus will not be found in your bank account. He is not there. Jesus will not be found in your perfect marriage. I guarantee you, he is not there. There, he is not here, church. He is risen. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There's a transformation of resurrection. And then we see, after this transformation that Peter and the disciples have, there's this unity that marks the early church. You see, the church experienced resurrection when it was unified. (laughs) You look in the scriptures and that the resurrection changed the entire makeup of the followers of Jesus. Not just the 11 disciples, but everybody who came after. You find in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, that Jesus deeply cares about unity. And the Father deeply cares about unity. Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, it says this, Every kingdom divided amongst itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided amongst itself can stand. That Jesus speaks about the entirety that a kingdom divided can't stand. And then he brings it down to our level. He's saying that your house, even the places in which you live, the cities in where you at, the family in which you are are, are living as a part of, if that is divided amongst itself, that won't be able to stand. That Jesus deeply cares about unity. Jesus gives us a warning in Matthew chapter 12 that there is not any blessing placed on disunity. But I don't just want to be a believer that is avoiding Jesus' warnings. I want to be a believer that experiences his blessings. We're not just here trying to avoid the things that God tells us to avoid. 
I want to be someone who loves the things that Jesus tells me to love. And it's one thing to try and avoid the warnings. It's a, one, it's a whole different thing to try and find and experience his blessings. A house dividing a, divided against itself cannot stand. But then Jesus, we see that gives so many other examples about the blessings that actually come from unity. Because we know that God can find you no matter where you are. He said he sent the disciples out two by two. God places a blessing on their unity. We find that the Holy Spirit fell in one place when they were all gathered together, that the Father loves unity, that the scriptures teach us that where there is unity, that God actually commands a blessing. It says that Jesus prayed for us in John chapter 17, that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. And even in Acts chapter four, it mentions that all of the believers were in one heart were and also were in one one mind, that wherever there is unity, that God commands a blessing. You see, the church is about more than just you. And the church is not about less than just you. The church is about more than just you. And the church is not about less than just you. Oftentimes we can get into a place like this in a church like this and the temptation that we have is to do one of two things that we can either place people on pedestals or place people as pieces. We have people on pedestals and say, we elevate their gifts, we elevate their talents, we elevate their money, we elevate what they can give to us and we place people on these high elevated status and we say, that's the important people. These are the people we need to listen to. These are the people we need to value. Or we place people as pieces. They're just a cog in the machine. They're just one thing that makes the big thing run. They just show up and as long as we all do our little part, then we're not really going to make too much big fuss out of anything else. As long as you do what you're supposed to do, we can do what we're supposed to do and everybody's going to be happy. We start to place people in these categories of pedestals or pieces. But the issue is where is there to go from a pedestal but down? And what is there to feel as a peace but frustration? That the church of Jesus is not just about us trying to be unified by placing somebody in an elevated position or placing somebody in an essential position. But Jesus is actually giving us a unity that goes much deeper than that. And I want to say that there's no church that's perfect there's no environment that's perfect. But by the grace of God, that won't be us. Placing people in pedestals. Placing people as pieces. That no matter who you are and no matter what you have, it's valuable. That no matter if you're rich, no matter if you're poor, no matter if you're influential, if you have no followers, no matter if you are a single mother, no matter if you're a hedge fund manager, no matter if you're white or if you're Asian, if you're Indian, no matter who you are, whatever you have matters. And there's something that God asks from all of us and the church is more than just you, but the church is not less than just you. That there is a place for every single one of us in this body. And that God gives us the grace to be able to see people. I'm so encouraged that the scriptures teach us that I'm not allowed to say that I don't need you. The scriptures teach us in Paul and teaches us in Corinthians. He says this exact thing. He says, now that I can't say to the foot that I have no need of you. But we are to give honor where honor is due. And that we are all parts of the body and individually members of of it. You see, whatever you have matters. Whatever you have matters. The grace of God can find you no matter where you go. And I'm so thankful that God's grace, it doesn't matter where I'm at, where I'm going, what I've done or what I'm doing, that the grace of God can meet me exactly where I'm at. That the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor and blessing of God can find me no matter where I am. 
That's a blessing that I can sit in this room and I can take a deep breath and I can say, God sees me and God knows me and God chose me and God is with me. And I can celebrate in that fact. But just because the grace of God can find you no matter where you are doesn't mean that we can. So you can sit in the back of this room or you can watch online for the rest of your life and the grace of God is going to be with you. But that doesn't mean that we will. And it's not because of anything that we've done. It's because the grace of God is limitless. It's unconditional. It can find you. It will search for you. It will take you up and it will place you on a rock. But just because God can find you in the back of the room doesn't mean that we can. I encourage you, place yourself in the position where God blesses and God blesses unity and community. That's where God's blessing gravitates to. That God's grace is actually gravitating towards unity. If you want to experience part of the resurrection, I encourage you, get into community. Be part of a unified body. And say, Lord, would your grace be able to find me in this place? I know you can find me at home. I know you can find me in the back of the room. I know you can find me when I sneak in church and then sneak out of church. But God, I want to be in the same position, not just where you can find me, but the church can find me. There's a resurrection that they experienced in their unity. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. They were of one heart and they're of one mind. And then the grace of God was experienced. The resurrection gave them a special grace to experience from Jesus. It says the grace of God was so powerfully with them. This, this, as I was doing a word study, it literally says that it had like mega grace with them. I don't even know what that means. That God's mega grace was with the church. And yet it says that the grace of God was so powerfully with them. If the gospel works then, it'll work now. When I was um, a youth pastor, we had the opportunity to go into a few schools around this area. And so we would uh, go and try and develop relationships with high schools and middle schools and do some character coaching that the administration would call us in to, to perform with some of the students and some of the athletes. And when we were doing some character coaching as a youth ministry at some of the schools, they would simply just say, can you help our students be uh, uh, more of a team? Can you help them stop uh, 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 skipping classes? Can you help them uh, with their work ethic? Can you help them stop doing X, Y, and Z, right? We would just try and help the students. And, and, and as we would go in, we would always give biblical principles um, without using the Bible, right? So we go in, we teach these biblical principles. Students would have their minds blown, and I'd be like, <laughs> it's the gospel. And so they wouldn't even know it, right? And so we'd go in, and one of, the, uh, one of the, 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 the lessons that we gave was titled The Success Trap. And it was this idea that um, you would be a high school student, you'd be getting your D1 offers, you'd get in your letter jackets, doing whatever you did, and, and feeling really successful. But then once you get successful, there's a trap that most people fall into that they stop doing the very thing that made them successful once they become successful. So they start giving up the fundamental things for the flashy things. You get the D1 offers and then you start posting on Instagram. You start showing everybody all of your hard work and the only time you ever work out is when somebody's filming it kind of thing. And so we gave them all these lessons like don't fall in to the success trap. And so maybe, we, we, maybe you could associate with that. You start only posting your successes and, and we start showing all these things. And, and we give this lesson. It is don't stop doing the things that made you successful in the first place. And I gave this analogy of imagine you had an apple tree and, and the apple tree started growing a few apples. And as the apple tree grows a few apples, all these branches get apples on it. And as the branch gets a few apples, all of a sudden it jumps off the tree. And I was like, how stupid would that be? And they're like, I'll be stupid. That doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, I know, but some of us, we jump off of the tree, jump and disconnect from the thing that made us successful in the first place. And they're like, oh my gosh. And what they didn't understand is I was literally just preaching John chapter 15. <laughs> Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do no good thing. If you're connected to me, you will bear much fruit. They didn't know it, but that's what I was preaching. 
And they were realizing, oh man, if I disconnect from the thing that made me successful in the first place, then I'm falling into the success trap. And church, what I would say to us today is our success trap is believing that the gospel got us here, but my effort will get us there. We stop doing the very thing that got us here in the first place. It says the apostles continued to testify about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. If there's anybody who did not need to keep talking about the resurrection, it's those who Jesus literally appeared to. And yet they couldn't stop talking about it. The apostles continued to testify. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. They continue to speak that you don't understand. There was this man named Jesus and he taught us and revealed to us the kingdom of heaven and was showing us the mysteries of God and was showing us that God came down in the form of a man and he died for our sins. And all of a sudden he was starting to forgive sins and he healed people and he was teaching. And then he gave us this thing called the Holy Spirit and he baptized us in it. And now I realize that I was far away from God, but those who are far have now been brought close. And he hung out with those who everybody thought was too far to be saved like prostitutes and tax collectors and now we are them and now we're saved and now he called us even ambassadors of the kingdom of God they continued to testify about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus if it ain't broke don't fix it the apostles were doing one simple thing they continued to testify And the longer I live with Jesus, the more I realize that this thing called Christianity is not a one-time decision. It is an everyday choice. I don't come to church one day, feel the goosebumps, raise my hand, say yes because the song and the preacher were motivating and leave and nothing changes. I'm not saying that the blood has to be reapplied to you every day. No, the blood works. It is finished. I'm saying that I don't work. And I need to come back to the resurrection of Jesus every single day. It's not this one-time thing where now I can just move on with my life. I come back to the cross and the resurrection and I ask the Holy Spirit to empower me, remind me, help me remember and continue to testify about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus every single day. You see, it's not a one-time decision, it's an everyday action. That's like the same thing as saying, yeah, I'm married to you. I don't have to show it. See, We are married, but it's not just about the wedding that you get married. It's about the whole marriage. Pastor Mark beautifully said it this way in our 715 series a few weeks ago. He said, we love preaching about the cross, the modern church. But the early church loved preaching about the resurrection. And don't mishear me. We're not putting the resurrection and the cross against each other. They are both crucial to the gospel. Jesus died for my sins, was the sacrifice for me. And he was raised on the third day, proving he was exactly who he said that he was. They're both crucial. And Pastor Mark gave this emphasis that there's this draw that we love as the modern church to focus on the cross rather than the resurrection. And if the cross shows you that Jesus is loving, then the resurrection will show you that Jesus is powerful. And for some reason, we have this dichotomy, and maybe you even realize which category you find yourself in, that, no, Jesus loves you. That's it. He loves you just the way that you are. Nothing needs to change. It's all good. Come as you are. He'll be there for you. It's all good. Nothing needs to change. And here's the thing. He loves you. And if you never change, he'll keep on loving you. That's true. Or you get people who are saying, I'm anointed. I'm going to preach. Everything that I do, God, you're going to breathe on it. And I'm going to be this fiery preacher who's going to yell at you and preach the power of the resurrection. And everything that I do is going to be infused with this gift of preaching. 
And yes, it's true. You are anointed. You do have power. You are filled. And it's not just about the cross. And it's not just about the resurrection. The gospel is the marriage of them both. That Jesus, he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That Jesus rose from the dead, proving he was exactly who he said that he was. And now gives me the Holy Spirit to say that now I will do greater works than he did. They're both the gospel. They are crucial to the gospel. And if we focus on just one, it's a pothole because we're going to have empathetic Christians with no power or powerful Christians with no empathy. Both are crucial to the gospel. And you might be sitting in this room saying, no, pastor, I get it. Like I've been in church for a long time. I get it, the gospel. But like what's next? Like, like what do I do now? I've been saved. I realize that truth. I'd say, what? <laughs> what? What more do you need? God died for you. What else is there? I mean, honestly, like God came down and did not send a prophet or an angel or another law or another rule. God died for you. And you're saying, what's next? This is next. This is the only thing that's next. This is the only thing that can change. This is the only thing that can give hope. That no matter who you are, where you've been, that Jesus died for you. And Jesus was raised for you, you don't grow beyond the gospel. You grow in the gospel. There's no graduation from this point. Consider yourself in it. Consider this your capstone. Consider this your cornerstone. Consider this the ultimatum. Consider this everything about the good news of Jesus. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. They continue to testify but the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's this tragic thought that so many of us have that yes, the gospel got me into the kingdom, but now that I'm here, I have to keep myself in it. Yeah, I know the gospel. What, what, I, what do I do now? No, this is now. This is today. This is tomorrow. This is the next day. I want to continue to testify about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know what it is about our human desire to keep on adding on to what Jesus finished. You know one of the last statements that Jesus said on the cross? It is finished. No more needs to be done. You don't need to put in any more work. You don't need to try and be a better person. Your morality doesn't matter anymore. Your success falls short. All this you can sum up in your own strength, not worth it. Which is why Paul was able to say in Corinthians, I have come to know nothing except for Christ and him crucified. Which means I might know a lot. Paul knew a lot. Paul did a lot. Paul was the guy who had the first five books of the Bible memorized. Paul knew a lot. And this was the guy who says, I have come to know nothing except for one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And from that, we get the most successful, the most theologically accurate, the most fruitful Christian to ever live. And we think that we're going to add to it with our degrees with our morality, with all the money that you can give and all the rules that you can keep, with all the things that you can leave as a legacy. No, you can't. You can't add anything to this gospel. You can't do any more that is added to this because it is finished. And if we could be a church that has come to know nothing except for Christ and him crucified, and I'm not saying that you forget everything. I'm saying that this one thing informs everything. It informs everything that you do. The resurrection of Jesus is where you start. It's where you are. And it's where you end. 
It's the grace of Jesus that I don't deserve it, and yet it was freely given to me, and it's not an act of works, and every other religion will teach you if you work for it, then you can reach it. If you're a good enough person, you'll get there. If you pray enough, you'll reach it. If you do enough good things to outweigh the bad things, then you'll reach it. And the gospel of Jesus is the only one that teaches grace. No matter what you've done, no matter how good you are, no matter how bad you are, no matter how much you can give, no matter how much you can sacrifice, his grace is reaching out for you. And now... Jesus' grace and love does not reach out to me because of what I've done. It reaches out to me in spite of what I've done. And I receive it as a gift to say there's nothing I could do to earn it. And so I'm going to keep on testifying that when people come to me with a works-based righteousness that says, God, I've worked for it. I've earned it. I've done a lot. I haven't done bad things in about three hours. God, aren't you pleased with me? That we can respond with, no, that's not it. You'll never be enough. You aren't enough. And yet the love of Jesus was extended to you. And that's why the apostles could continue to testify about the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And it's by grace that you've been saved. See, the gospel is not broken. Don't fix it. I'm going to continue to testify about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We're not just going to leave it in Easter. We're going to live in it every single day. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are the beginning and the end. <laughs> and you have made a way for all men to be saved. Lord, I'm believing that right now you're going to awaken some hearts in the room and at home, Lord. Lord, to allow us to remember the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. To know that this is where we start, it's where we are, and it's where we end. That Lord, you have transformed us. You have made us from what we weren't to what we are. In Jesus, we are gonna actively remember, actively live in the truth and the reality of the resurrection knowing that there's nothing beyond it. If there's anyone in this room who has not given their life to Jesus, has not experienced that grace, doesn't know the never-ending love from the Father that was perfectly expressed in the person of Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to receive that gift right now, exactly where you are. If there's anyone in this room or online who says, I don't know if that's my reality. I'm experiencing the resurrection like that. I don't know if I'm saved by grace through faith. I just want you to raise your hand right now so I can pray for you. If there's anyone in this room, if there's anyone here who wants to experience the forgiveness that only Jesus offers. Amen. Amen. If that's you, I want you to pray this with me in your heart. Just say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for sinning against you. I choose to repent and to turn away from things that I know to be sin so that you might create in me, Lord, a resurrection life. Holy Spirit, I invite you into my heart. Make me new. And make me more like Jesus. Father, I love you. And thank you for loving me. Empower me to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
you just made that decision, I want to say congratulations. You're going to experience and you're going to hear some more information from Pastor Miata in just a minute.